All right, so let's me start here. So numbers five through seven. So for those who follow in the Torah portion, I'm going off a little bit. Um, so I'm sorry, I know that may mess you up. Um, the Torah um, this weekend is Shavuot, which is a very uh, wonderful celebration of um, you count from 50 days from the Passover and you celebrate um, Shavuot um, by it, it, when it was first instituted. Let me, hold on, let me admit a couple of people here. When it was first instituted, it was uh, for the purpose of showing gratitude and thanks for the, the harvest that Yahweh has provided. So um, I think most of us are finishing with that or um, have already done so, um, depending on which days. Sometimes the days are different depending on which calendars you follow. But I decided to continue with numbers instead. So hopefully that doesn't mess too many people up. It's still the word. It's still uh, exciting principles that he's bringing about. So I'm looking forward to getting into that. So thank you guys for joining me. May Yahweh bless you and keep you as we read this. Um, so chapter five, six, and seven is what I'm looking at today. I mean, I'm hoping, guys, as we move forward. By the way, I'm going to do this every week. Um, that's my hope and plan, Yahweh willing, is to do this every week. I'm keeping the same code. Um, I figured out how to do that. So that code that I'm sending you or that you receive from someone, if you were to keep that and just show up every uh, Sabbath, Saturday at nine o'clock this time, hopefully you'll see my face here if you always says the same. So uh, we're going to look at chapters five, six, and seven. I am pumped up and excited. Uh, Sharon um, was joined earlier, a friend of mine and a co-educator. Um, and she was asking, how much time do you spend doing this? And I thought it takes me all week to make these lessons. I, I take a chapter a day usually. I do start Sunday, put the audio together. Monday, do chap the first chapter, Tuesday, next chapter. Thursday and Friday, put the PowerPoint together. I'm just sharing this, guys, because um, a lot of work goes into this so that your ministry can be fruitful. I'm trying to do my part um, so that whatever you receive, you can take to, to bless your own ministry. I don't know what your ministry is. If you're teaching someone, if you're um, blessing someone else with this, I don't know what, what it is that you're doing, but um, I, I, I want to encourage you that, uh, that, you know, I'm going to do whatever I, can, whatever I can to make it special for you um, and serve you. All right, let's get into it. Chapter five, I want to look at these three ideas today. I want to encourage you as you're reading through it. Um, oh, I think that's what I meant to say. Please make sure or try to read these chapters beforehand. I would love to hear the insights and the questions that you have um, because of your own personal readings. Um, that makes these discussions that much more fruitful and full. And uh, people are blessed because of things that you share. So chapter five, six, and seven, you shall put out both male and female, putting them outside the camp that they may not defile their camp in the midst of which I dwell. That's the first idea I want to look at. In chapter six, you hear the Aaronic blessing. We hear that a lot for those who are in the Hebrew Roots Torah community, um, the Aaronic blessing. And there's so much there. I'm only going to look at one or two words that, that really are impactful. Um, chapter seven, the chiefs of Israel approached and brought their offerings before Yahweh. Six wagons, 12 oxen, a wagon for every two of the chiefs and for each one of each one in ox. You know, some of these scriptures seem so innocent. Like, what could you talk about with that? Like, that just seems like, yeah, and what? What's the point? So I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. I want to start out with what I did last week. Some of you guys missed it. Um, the Bible Project did a great job of giving a summary of the book of Numbers. And I'm going to start out with the first piece of that because we're still in that first part of the book to give us some um, context. And then we'll get into reading the scriptures and uh, we'll read chapter five and I'll come back on. So let's, uh, let's do that. Shabbat Shalom, everyone who just joined. Um, love to see your faces. It brings me so much encouragement. And thanks for sharing with others um, about what we're doing here. The book of Numbers gets overlooked, partly because it has a really boring name. Which is a shame. In the Hebrew tradition, the book's name is Bamidbar, which means in the wilderness. And it's an epic travel log about Israel's journey through the desert on their way to the land promised to Abraham. Now this pilgrimage should only take about two weeks on foot. But instead, it takes them about 40 years. That's crazy. It's practically half of someone's lifetime. Yeah, it's a very long camping trip with lots of interesting stories, but... Let's remember, it's most helpful to back up and start with how this book is designed. Right. So the book is broken up into five sections. There are three wilderness locations broken up by two road trips that link all the pieces together. 
The first wilderness section is Mount Sinai, right here on the map. And then in the second section, they travel to a region called Paran. A whole bunch of things happen here in the wilderness of Paran. And then in this fourth section is Israel's road trip to Moab. The book ends with a large section in the wilderness of Moab, right across the Jordan River from the Promised Land. Now, through all of these sections, the storyline just flows like a gripping dramatic movie. Everything starts great, but then the trip goes horribly wrong, and it all ends with the final redemptive moment, the surprising act of God's grace. So let's jump into this story. It all begins at the wilderness at Mount Sinai, and we've become really familiar with this mountain. Yeah, if you remember, Israel came here after Egypt, and they formed a covenant with God here, got the Ten Commandments here, built the tabernacle here, and they've been at this mountain for one full year. And now they take a census to number the people as they prepare to leave. Right, and they're given these instructions for how to organize all those people in the camp. God's presence in the tabernacle, and then the tribe of Levi and the priests around it, and then the rest of the tribes around them. And this pattern, it's this visual symbol for how God's holiness is at the center of their existence as a people. And they're told that when the cloud of God's presence moves, they're to pack up and travel with it. Yeah, the Ark of the Covenant is carried by the Levites out in front, and then the tribe of Judah, and on and on. And this order is also a symbol for how God's holy presence is their leader and guide through the wilderness. The book of Numbers Chapter 5 And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper and everyone that has an issue, and whoever is defiled by the dead. Both male and female shall you put out, outside the camp shall you put them, so that they do not defile their camps in the midst of which I dwell. And the children of Israel did so, and put them out outside the camp. As Yahweh spoke to Moses, so did the children of Israel. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, when a man or woman shall commit any sin that men commit to do a trespass against Yahweh, and that person is guilty, then they shall confess their sin which they have done, and he shall recompense his trespass with the principle of it, and add to it the fifth part of it, and give it to him against whom he has trespassed. But if the man has no kinsman to recompense the trespass to, let the trespass be recompensed to Yahweh, to the priest, beside the ram of atonement, whereby an atonement shall be made for him. And every offering of all the holy things of the children of Israel, which they bring to the priest, shall be his. And every man's hallowed things shall be his, Whatsoever any man gives the priest, it shall be his. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, and a man lie with her carnally, and it is hid from the eyes of her husband, and it is kept close, and she is defiled, and no witness against her, neither is she taken, and the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he is jealous of his wife, and she is defiled? Or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he is jealous of his wife, and she is not defiled? Then shall the man bring his wife to the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her, the tenth part of an ephah of barley meal. He shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense on it. For it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, bringing defilement to remembrance. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before Yahweh. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel, and of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle the priest shall take and put into the water. And the priest shall set the woman before Yahweh and uncover the woman's head and put the offering of memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that caused us the curse. And the priest shall charge her by an oath and say to the woman, If no man has lain with you, and if you have not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of your husband, and be you free from this bitter water that causes the curse. But if you have gone aside to another instead of your husband, and if you are defiled, and some man have lain with you beside your husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing, 
And the priest shall say to the woman, Yahweh make you a curse and an oath among your people, when Yahweh does make your thigh to rot and your belly to swell. And this water that causes the curse shall go into your bowels and to make your belly to swell and, sh and your thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. And the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall blot them out with the bitter water. And he shall cause the woman to drink the bitter water that causes the curse. And the water that causes the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. And then the priest shall take the jealousy offering out of the woman's hand and shall wave the offering before Yahweh and offer it upon the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of the offering, the memorial of it, and burn it upon the altar and afterwards shall cause the woman to drink the water. And when he has made her to drink the water, then it shall come to pass. If she is defiled and have done trespass against her husband, that the water that causes the curse shall enter into her and become bitter, and her belly shall swell, and her thigh shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse among her people. And if the woman is not defiled but is clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive seed. This is the law of jealousies. When a wife goes aside to another instead of her husband and is defiled. Or when the spirit of jealousy comes upon him and he is jealous over his wife and shall set the woman before Yahweh and the priest shall ex execute upon her all this law. Then the man shall be guiltless from iniquity and this woman shall bear her defilement. End of chapter. All right, Shabbat Shalom again to everyone. I know it's, uh, new people have joined. Um, numbers 5, 3, I want to look at. So, wow, incredible chapter. Um, so we're still in the camp here. Yahweh, the last lesson we talked about, how he gave different roles to the Levites, and they structured themselves. They know how to move now. They know who's doing what roles. Um, now we're getting into, you know, the most of that chapter is spent talking about what if this woman, what if a, a, a wife... Uh, was suspected of adultery and how to handle that. So that was a severe uh, penalty, as you can see. But before we even started that chapter, um, right in the beginning, it says, you shall put out both male and female, putting them outside the camp, that they may not defile their camp in the midst of which I dwell. And this was talking about anyone who has any, any uh, leprosy, any conditions that were unholy or unclean, they were had to be put outside the camp put outside the camp. So I had a picture here. I don't know if that's what it looked like, but being outside the camp um, is a place that you didn't want to be. Uh, one second. So my question here is, uh, and, and, I, and I'm always thinking guys, and I want to encourage us to do the same is why, why would Yahweh come up with this? Um, in the Eastern times, in the Eastern area, and during this time, this was a new idea. The Egyptians certainly didn't do this. Um, this the, I mean, these guys are completely quarantined. Yahweh came up with the idea of quarantining. Um, so he says, you got to be completely outside the camp now. So why would he do that? There's two things that he mentioned here, um, and it's kind of subtle. One is more, more explicit, another is subtle right here in this verse 3 that I want to expound a little bit on as we understand who Yahweh is. Who is Yahweh? Why does he think like this? And what can we learn from him? What does he really want? You know, there's a scripture that says, uh, find out what pleases the Lord. Find out. And as we look at this, we don't want to just look at the surface of things, but really look into the heart of Yahweh. What is he getting after? So I have a couple of questions. Um, and, and, and I'm always happy, guys, to hear your voices, to see your faces, to you talk back to me. So don't feel like you don't, you're going to interrupt me. I know because I'll be, I'll go in and I'll teach and I'll preach and I'll keep going for sure. I have no problem with that. But I, I love to hear you. See, like uh, Brother Brandon or Brandon, whatever. Hey, I just had something. Um, sometimes I may not catch uh, the chats because it causes me to have to look to a different direction and I've missed it. But uh, just want to let you know, feel free to jump in at any point if you had a question or a comment. What reason was given for putting out such individuals? And when I ask a question, I'm actually, if you have an response, I'm open to it. What reason was given for putting out such individuals? Hey, brother, this is uh, 
AKA, AKA Neo, but it's really Rudy Martinez. <laughs> AKA, which one you want, Neo or Rudy? Uh, Rudy, I, I just failed to change uh, my phone uh, on the, my uh, my settings, so I just leave it there and I, I kind of give a disclaimer and let them know who I am so that way they don't feel that I'm some character out of a comic book or something. Hey, okay. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, I'm thinking uh, since we're in numbers, and it had to be kind of like a, a progression. They've and I think we heard in the video that this trip that was supposed to be like two weeks was taking them almost forty years. Right. So a certain amount of time that was invested, and I'm thinking maybe. And this is my because you read about it, hear about it, and I'm just going to throw it out there. You know, when it talks about the Shekinah glory, mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking that, you know, this is something that's actually uh, supposed to be. Uh, a holy occurrence or, or a setting in a sense, uh, because, you know, when you read in the scripture where it says that there's these four angels in heaven that they circle around uh, Yahweh and they're covering their, their faces and they're, and this is like around the clock uh, uh, praising him and saying, right. holy, holy, holy. So, you know, they're pretty much about the holy holiness thing, uh, impure, uh, uh, keeping clean and all this. And I'm thinking, yeah. well, you know, for people, he's asking us to do this. It, it's not, uh, uh, how you say, arbitrary or uh, out of the question to keep this camp uh, her, uh, pure. And like you mentioned earlier, it was something about quarantine. Uh, and I was just leading uh, into another part, you know, like uh, when you look at Exodus, when they talk about uh, where it says that they were, what was it in, they were to dwell inside this, their abode uh, as the Passover uh, was coming uh, or the death angel and they painted the uh, the doorpost. That was almost kind of in a sense, uh, self quarantining, uh, what you call in shelter, uh, um, staying more or less uh, as opposed you know, to what's going on right now in uh, uh, with the COVID. And I'm thinking, uh, it's not, because now they're saying like, you know, I'm going on a rant, I know. <laughs> now they're saying about this in sheltering, uh, some people are actually getting, you know, getting sick or not, uh, it's not helping as much. And I'm thinking, well, maybe what we need to focus on is is the, uh, the person of Yah Yahweh. In other words, he, uh, he's the one that actually offers up protection and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that's all. I'm just going to leave it like that because I don't want to get too far into it. Yeah, yeah, you're good. Thank you. But but you mentioned the Shekinah glory and this idea of holiness, Rudy. And I think that's what I'm seeing, too. Uh, and, I, and, and, and just a side note, I do not claim to know everything, uh, how everything works. And this, you know, I got it all. I am the uh, teacher and whatever of all. I'm like, I promise you I'm not that person. <laughs> Um, so I'm trying to grapple around in the dark sometimes, just as we just as we all are trying to figure out and understand who he is. And I'm using the scriptures to do that. Um, but no, I want to I, I wanted to um, did somebody. I, I feel like somebody was going to say something. Was it? Yeah, Brandon, this is Wendy. Hey. Um, good morning. Shabbat shalom. Uh, if you look at uh, do you remember when uh, Caleb and Joshua and 12 tribes went out there? Mm -hmm. And they brought home uh, bad, bad evil, evil for most majority of them. And what he did is he got rid of that. Because if you look at the physical portion, um, when there is like a poison or something, it's going to infest everybody. And so that's why with the negative thinking and everything else, he yeah. takes them out till they get their stuff right and then they can come back in. Yeah. So that's just another way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned something really important when did I see it in this verse, you, you say you're going to infect everybody. And as you see in this verse right here, when you, when you're reading, it says that they, that they may not what defile their camp. And, and you, and, and I want to uh, emphasize the fact that it's not a, I'm not mad at you, <laughs> but we can't have that spreading. Um, so in this case, it's not like necessarily that these people sinned. It was just, they had a condition that could spread. Um, so I don't want to defile the whole camp. Um, so male, female, whoever, uh, we can't have that whole thing, defile, the whole people defile. 
The other thing that Rudy alluded to um, that stood out to me as well is um, in the midst of which I dwell. In the midst of which I dwell. What do you mean? Well, I dwell here. I live here now. I'm living right here in the middle of all you guys. So there's certain ways that you cannot be anymore. And this is a, this gets me excited. This whole idea, Yahweh says, now that I know you used to be in Egypt, I'm bringing you out. I'm living right among you now. And now I need to give you some rules. I need to make a covenant with you. And there's some expectations because you can't live like that no more. Have you ever had company come over? You're like, okay, the company's here now. We need, we can't just keep doing what we've been doing. We can't keep that room like this. Company's here. Well, Yahweh says, oh, well, hold on, I'm here now. Now that I'm here in your house, we can't keep doing this. <laughs> we can't. Now, I love you, and we there's a certain way we can be, but we can't live like this. I'm in the midst of you now. Um, so we see those two things. One, I don't want to file the whole camp, and two, um, Yahweh is here. I'm in the midst and I'm holy. And because I'm holy, you see this reverberated throughout the Bible from beginning to the end. Because I'm holy, you need to be holy. Um, it, it has to go that way. So where does Yahweh dwell now? Where does Yahweh dwell now? Uh, I guess it should be in our hearts. In our bodies. So in our hearts, in our bodies, he's somewhere inside. He's somewhere in there. I mean, we hear it from the scriptures. So not only is he dwelling among us in the camps, he says, now my life is in you, in me. Yeah. Matter of fact, somewhere it says you're the temple. What? You're the our, spirit, our soul and our spirit. Unbelievable, isn't it? Think about that. If we had to be this careful living among Yahweh in, in our midst, how much more careful and how much more uh, uh, determined is he wanting us to be holy now that he lives in us? I'm inside of you. I'm with you. My Holy Spirit is there. I am there. I'm not just in your zip code now. I'm right here with you. So we see this other passages come up because of that idea. First Corinthians 6. So because Yahweh's in our, our midst, and this same principle continues to go on. We don't have that same setup anymore, that temple and the structure. But he says, I'm here. I dwell here. So here's my expectations. I'm going to share scriptures that you've heard before. But man, when I read them, they're so, they're, they're so poignant. They're so convicting. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership? has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord, let me pull out this red piece. What accord has Christ with Bilal? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. For we are the temple. And so Paul is making this argument saying, what are you, these don't even go together. What they, I, there's holiness here. Don't mix those two. Because we see the same principle, I'm in your midst. We got to keep those separate. I will make my dwelling among them. He said, I will make my dwelling among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says Yahweh, and touch no unclean thing. I know what you're thinking. I got to move. Oh, man, because this is a bad place. I'm, I got to, where is the place I need to go to? No, we, not literally all the time that we need to, I got to get up and move because there's nowhere you can go. <laughs> where are you going to go? Um, where are you going to find only always people in this camp? I mean, hope, uh, uh, one day, one day. Or as they say in Spanish, I think, uh, pero no hoy. I got some Spanish speakers who probably can correct me. It means not today. Um, therefore, go out from the midst and be separate from them and touch no unclean thing. This is our spirit. Is this your spirit? He says, no, I need you to be holy. I'm here now. I'm in your midst. I'm living with you. Then I will welcome you and I'll be a father to you and shall be sons and daughters. To, um, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says Yahweh Almighty. This is what Yahweh is saying. This is not my words. He's saying, come out from them and be separate. It's so easy for us to be... Uh, accepted and tolerant and kind of mix in. We do that without even thinking about it. You don't have to wake up and try to figure out how I'm going to mix in and be not standing out. 
or be the peculiar people. I think that's the word he used to call his people. They're peculiar. They're a little bit strange, a little bit weird sometimes. I'm not saying seek weirdness, but in seeking holiness, sometimes you're going to be perceived that way, aren't you? People are going to see you um, observing Sabbath, wearing tassels. They're going to see you forgiving people. Why are you forgiving them? You see how they treated you? They're going to see you loving people that you shouldn't be loving. You shouldn't be. What, what are you doing? You don't watch the same shows. Why you don't? Why you, you don't watch? You didn't want you to see that movie? No, I, I didn't. I didn't see that. You don't listen to that? No, I don't. I don't listen. You, you kind of weird. I've gotten that a lot. Um, it's hard to watch TV, uh, but there's a lot of things that you come out from. Here's one of my favorite passages in the Bible because it's so full and so short. Here in, in chapter seven, verse one, on this on this topic, he continues his thought. It says, "Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves." And every, the, from every defilement, from how much? From every defilement of body and spirit. I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to us. He's speaking to us. Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. It's so, I, I love coming back to the word of God. I love that you guys show up. I love that you're listening because every week I'm reminded of Yahweh's voice and his expectations. And I'm like, oh, that's a, that's like cold water to my face. Like, wow, I, for, I forgot, a, man, where was I? I was actually thinking, he says, no, 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 come out, be separate. There is no, oh, this is about like, and this is okay. He's like, no, no, come out from them. Be separate from them. Touch no unclean, nothing, no unclean thing. A little bit. No. See, in our world, we're so inundated by so much impurity and so much lewdness. I mean, you can't turn around without finding something in, uh, sexually implicit, innuendo, uh, crude joking, the uh, way people carry themselves, dread. You can't go anywhere. It's so, so our standards can start to waver and say, well, this is not as bad as that. We start comparing. But when we come back to the word, he says, I have a whole nother standard. He says, I have nothing to do with that. No, no, I'm not as bad and I have nothing. Don't touch it. He says, every, um, cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body. Keep your body clean. Keep your, how you eat, how you, how you work. He said, keep it, take care of your body. Um, um, impurity sexually, keep it clean. Not just your body, he says, your spirit too. Here's where most of the time we miss it. Our spirits. Are we washing our spirits? We'll take a bath every day, most of us. I know the girls are the guys. I don't know. It's okay. I'm with you sometimes. Well, not right. Not 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 anymore. I'm married now, so it's different. But when I was single, I had a bath every day for what? I'm good. We got the bath thing down every day, the brushing your teeth. But are you washing your spirit? Are you keeping it clean? Our spirits go neglected so often, guys. Where we're, it's not being, we feed our bodies. We eat the pizza, the burgers, the cheese, the potatoes, and we're getting our, our, our we can, I, I'm, if I, when I look at you, I can see we're not missing that many meals. But if we had a chance, my goodness, what if we had an x ray that could separate your body from your spirit? We can see how you're doing with your body. I see you've been working out, I see you've been eating every day. What would our spirits look like? Will your spirit be malnourished? Barely hanging on? Would it be receiving cancer treatments? What would it look like? What would it say to you? I'm not being fed enough. You haven't fed me in three days. You're not training me. We're not spending any time with me. You take care of your body. You run after the flesh. You're hungry. You eat. You, 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 but I'm hungry. So he says, keep your experience clean. Bringing holiness to completion. We need to bring holiness to completion. The, the, the goal is holiness, and it needs to be brought to wholeness, to completion. Hear God's words. He does not play as the world does. He's not think as we do. And these lessons are, incur are a reminder that he does not, and he's completely separate from that. So take a moment right now to reflect on how. And you actually talk to me. I want to get some of this out. How can we keep ourselves, our body and spirits clean? Well, let me tell you, let me say the opposite. In what ways can we become tainted in our bodies and in our spirits? Because I, I want to just pause here and make sure we flesh this out 
so we can become because you you do these things for so long and you don't think about them you're just like i didn't even think about that because we didn't stop and think about it and i'm afraid that if i keep moving on we're just gonna be like yeah that's true but i don't see it so let me mention something if somebody jump in and help me with this um one of the things for me i spend a lot of time on computers because that's my job now i'm at home and plus making lessons man I, it's always a challenge um because the 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 algorithms are set up to get your attention so whether i do a youtube search a google whatever they always have a little as a commercial and i'm gonna be honest they're not the most holy you i don't know what computer you use but i don't know whatever i go to it's like man it's not it's not what i'm trying it's, sometimes it's not even necessarily bad it's just a distraction but i'm like this is not good for my spirit i can't but man it seems so tantalizing sometimes at work i'm giving you some examples and again you can jump in here i'm gonna i'll give you one more unless somebody say something um sometimes at work uh in an effort not to stick out too much you can be tempted to joke and laugh around with things that really are not funny this has been the i've learned this in high school when i first came to um, christ then this is uh this i actually i'm gonna get to that later but when I first came to Christ, that was a big deal, is people will be laughing and joking about things that I knew Yahweh didn't think was funny. Mm -hmm. He didn't think was funny at all. And I kind of smiled, and I promise you, he wasn't even smiling. He says, have nothing to do with that. And actually, there's a scripture we're going to look at in a second. But I want you to get the spirit of Yahweh and us to be reminded of his high standard. He says, stop that. None of that stuff I have nothing to do with. Um, somebody else has anything? Matthew 5, you have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, but everyone who looks at a woman with the intent to lust. See, I always read that scripture growing up and in different translation where it says, if you lust after her, it's like adultery. But if you look at the Greek, and you look at the different translations, you find out that he says you're guilty because you intended to lust. Woo! He says, I have a whole new standard. I'm dwelling in you now. I'm dwelling in you now. We don't do that. You've already sinned. He says, but I actually didn't lust. It was nothing to lust after. I, I know I didn't. But I, you turned your head and your eyes. You turned your mind with the intent to do so. You're guilty because we don't play like that. See, so you're on a different level. You're saying, well, I didn't commit a crime. I did nothing bad. I didn't hurt nobody. He says, no, you don't understand. You don't understand where we're living. I, I'm speaking to myself. I may be alone on this. Hey, brother, um, yes, it's kind of uh, interesting that you say that because I was just thinking about these commercials where they have a couple kind of walking down the street and the guy's with his his girlfriend or wife and you know, casually walking, and then there's nice-looking young lady passes by, and he does, how they say, that craning of his neck, <laughs> and the girlfriend just slugs him. <laughs> I well, mean, he may not have thought of anything about it, but the, 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 the woman that he's with, is, you know, is pretty much sure where that was going to go, you know, just trying to set the record straight, you know, on him. Who, who, you're, who you're with, you know. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because – of man and woman, right? We're from Yahweh. That's the wholeness of Yahweh. And one of the things that a wife would do or a woman would do if this is like, and we can go back and forth on this between a woman and a man too. We can go, hey, a man can see different things, but you can see Yahweh's indignation for that. And you share it with your wife. <laughs> you you like, you if you're struggling with like, ah, well, you, yeah, share it with your wife. Let's see how that goes. You'll get some of the some of the indignation and wrath of Yahweh. He says, "Now let me show you." What, because between you and yourself, it's like, oh, you know, between you sometimes maybe another brother. You're like, well, yeah, yeah, share with your wife. I promise you, a whole, I promise you it's a whole other level. True. Um. So great point on that. Um. 
if you're and, and if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body to go into hell. I'm still in the Bible. I'm still in the Torah because he says you need to leave the camp. They had a condition that was not holy as he was there. They had to leave the man or woman. You have to leave the camp. He says, look, you need to throw it off, cut it off. What in your life right now needs to be cut off, torn out, or thrown away? Now, I'm, not asking you to, I'm not asking uh, you to say that publicly, by the way. Um, so I won't put nobody out there, but I want you to think about that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was. Oh, Miss Dottie. Yes, I, I was just going to say that you just cannot believe what it means to a wife to have her husband look away mm. when he should look away mm. and to teach his sons, you don't look at that, to have someone put on the TV screen, I will set no evil thing before mm. my eyes, mm. to teach those teenage boys as best we can in this wicked world mm. by his example of godliness and it means everything to a wife wow. to have a husband that she is enough mm. you know i i was never good enough to please my dad growing up but i've always been good enough to please my husband mm. and it means everything to a wife so you know um, i've i've heard preachers say that you know they had a problem with uh, porn and lust before they were saved and the way that they conquered it was every time that uh, thought came into their mind they would say a scripture mm. and the enemy got so tired of hearing the word of Yahweh that he left them alone and so in this wicked world, I think we need to, um, you know, be to each other only. And um, I, I just can't tell you what, what it does for your marriage, mm. that you don't take that second look. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't help the birds flying over your head, but you don't have to let them nest in your in your hair right and uh, in this wicked world uh, what an example you know it says without holiness we will not see our elohim and that that is a scary thought in mm. this wicked world he wants us to shine forth just like those hanukkah candles they shine forth at night and they shine brightly and, and they're in the window for everyone to see that this house, this, this home belongs to Yahweh. Amen. Oh, so good, Miss Dottie. Thank you for that. And, I, and you said, in, in your speaking of that, Miss Dottie, you, you, you say something very profound. That the fact that a wife understands that struggle. Yes. Like we, like as a woman, you have struggles uh that are different from a man you know that insecurities or whatever it is you, you have different struggles but for a wife to understand that and for you to say you know what i see what you're doing i respect that you know as a father with four daughters yes man, i have to be oh this it's in front of me all the time where i'm having to teach that i'm having to show that and reflect that and I wish I could say I was perfect. Oh, I wish I could say I was perfect and be coming to you, but I can't. I'm humbled and I'm sober by the challenge it is every day. I, I know, and I'm speaking for every man, how we're bombarded. And Satan's after that, to tear down that man, yeah. to tear down his home. And it, it got me really angry one time when I realized that I'm not fighting my, my flesh in and of itself, but I have an enemy who's after my family. 
Yes. And when I realized that, it, 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 and here's, it, it, uh, as a man, there's something that God puts us in this. Well, I said, you better not. When I realized that, I'm like, oh, you know, you're not going to attack my family. No, you are not going to. That stirred up something in me that nothing else could. Amen. And, um, you know, we get, we're in the country now. We get scorpions and spiders all the time. You know, when I used to live growing up, we had roaches. Roaches are nothing now. I'm like, we get scorpions and spiders everywhere. Um, so moths and I'm like, what is going on? But uh, I don't like to kill scorpions. These things are just ugly looking. They got this crushy shell. Um, one of the times they, they got into my wife's shoe and it, it pinched her, whatever, oh. bit, whatever they do. Um, so we have to check our shoes now. But uh, I don't like killing them. I don't like killing the spiders. As a matter of fact, my daughter came downstairs just a minute ago while we were talking. She's like, there's a spider upstairs. We get spiders all the time. They're just, I just, I just like, okay, just that little one up there. We'll come back later. My point is that I don't like killing them, but you know what I don't like more? I don't like them hurting my family. <laughs> and I will conjure up what I need to in order to make sure you're destroyed. So huge point, huge point. And I think it's one that, that we don't talk enough about, but that is very rampant. Um, in our community. So uh, thanks for sharing and, that. Um, and but, something, uh, just just a, a brief point is that, you know, where I grew up in, in the deep south, uh, when, when I, where I went to high school, um, you know, it just seemed like the girls were supposed to stay pure, but the boys could just sow their wild oats. And when I met a man that was pure because he loved God so much. Uh, it just blew me away. And it's like the most attractive thing mm. there is to a woman. Mm. But as the father of little girls, at some point you need to teach them, or maybe your wife does, that you know it is also a wife's job to be what her husband needs. You know, if you don't want him, um, you know, going out and, and lusting in the world and you need to be what he needs you to be mm -hmm. and and that's what Yahweh made and and that's what you know it breaks the heart of uh my husband and I because we you still there daddy okay I think I lost him Oh, man, some good stuff. We got marriage counseling here. This is free. <laughs> so we didn't charge for this. We should charge for marriage counseling. Um, no, this is good stuff. I'm going to continue with the point. Uh, cut it off. Throw it away. Torn out. And I'm saying this. Look, I'm preaching to myself right now. I, you know, we want to give ourselves levels and graduate gradually through a process. I got a 10-step process. I don't see that in this passage. He says, I need you to cut that off. Some things, look, we just got to, no, cut, tear it out. No, stop. There is no, well, you know, I'm working on it. I have this plan. He's like, no, I said, stop. By my holy power, by the power that's in me, stop. You know, people have struggled with smoking and, 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 and realized, oh, smoking is not good for my body. It's not good for the temple. I've seen people who have become Christians, were baptized, and they stopped smoking. Just stop, just like, I'm not going to do that no more. I'm not going to do it. Or I've, I've heard of people, not necessarily religious, who've heard that they were about to die. When they got that news, they're like, I'm good. I'm done with it. Up until that point, they were struggling. Like, oh, it's uh, you can. The powers are for us to do so. Cut it off. Tear it out. Throw it away. His spirit is there guiding us, giving us the power to do these things. Um, so have encouragement that you can um, take that step. Huge point. My goodness. I had a lot of comments. I see some of you guys in um, the comments. So I appreciate that. I'm trying to listen. Um, let me go on to my next point. Unless somebody else has something else. Um, oh, I know her. Da, 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 da. All right. Yes. Yes. Just close the door.
Hey, Brandon, can I hear you? I had my mic on mute the whole time. Oh, okay. I better keep the start over. Thank you for saying something. I'm just going in. Um, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved and loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you. He says, "Not don't. It shouldn't even be named. Forget the fact that it's happening. I, it shouldn't even be a. That shouldn't what." as is proper among saints. Guys, there's a standard of holiness that we must be returning back to consistently. Not even mention. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are what? Out of place. These things are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetousness, who, who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God <clears throat> has no inheritance in the kingdom. I didn't say that. You know, some people are like, hey, don't judge me. <laughs> it's a scripture. It says you have no inheritance if this is a life. Man, convicting. We don't. Crude joking? Just a, it's just a joke. God wants us to have fun. <laughs> the things we can tell ourselves and the things we hear um, in, in and around our homes and workplaces are not in congruence with what the word of God says. So I want to remind you his voice. No inheritance in the kingdom. These cannot even be mentioned among you. She did what? She laughed at what? That wasn't, that's not what I laugh at. What's funny about that? What might, why might it be difficult? Why might it be difficult to maintain this level of holiness? And for who might this be more so difficult? For who might this be more so? Why might this be difficult to maintain this level of, uh, Miss Dottie, uh, sorry, I lost you there. I don't know what happened, but I got you back now, it looks like. Uh, why, might this, why might it be difficult to maintain this level of holiness? Okay, I um, it is a difficult to look at the commercials or look at um, just listen to all the songs. Um, yeah, the way everybody po posts, women right, right. post uh, booth, boobies, and men post uh, girls, a lot of girls with 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 a, with, with it on the bed. Uh, a lot of um, singers and set of celebrities it the world is just uh, full of a uh, evil temptation um it, it is difficult to to be not contagious mm. to that uh, right we have to always remind ourselves be aware of holiness and make the good choice all the time all the <clears throat> yeah you said it you say always all the time we're, we're, we're constantly constantly inundated mm -hmm. with everything it's, it's one of the reasons it's difficult we're constantly inundated it's like a sea of impurity it's like a sea of ungodliness even the things that seem innocent god says that's not innocent we we start to mix up things that seem okay now that are completely an abomination to yahweh because we hear it so much on the news, we see it in the media, we talk to our friends, and we're trying to figure out how to live here without being too strange. But in the end, we're going to become more and more strange. As the scripture says, strangers in this earth. This, this is a strange place. Who does that? Who talks like that? Who think, who, who, what? This is strange. And I'm not saying that we are ignorant of these things, but in our lives, they should be not, not, not even named. Why might this be difficult? When I became um, a, a follower of Christ, I grew up in the church, but I never seriously accepted that life um, and, and really read what the Bible says and try to live it. But when I decided to do that in seriousness and was baptized, um, I was a high school uh, senior. And you know how tough it is <laughs> to be a disciple as a, a student? You know, it's one thing as an adult, because 
as an adult, you're kind of like, and it's, it's tough as an adult, but as a teen, you're still trying to figure yourself out. The peer pressure, like your high school is your world. So you keep thinking about, hold on. You gotta wait, mama, while I finish my lesson. I'll be out there to talk to you in just a minute. Okay, she hit you right. Close the door. That was that was Ava? If you heard her, um, beautiful kid. Uh, she some some something happened with her leg. For those who wanted an update, um, but in high school, I mean, it's not. It, it's like, who? What are you doing? Who? We don't do that. That's weird. You're strange. Um, it can be difficult for them. It can be difficult if you work in a workplace uh, where worldliness is lifted up. Well, worldliness is the job. Uh, well, that the context, it, it, it can be challenging. And I want to point out these things because in this moment right now where we're talking about it, we can feel comfortable to have this conversation and not be, uh, I don't want to say judged or persecuted and all this thing. But as soon as we leave this conversation, as soon as you leave your home, you get on the phone or whatever, you're in a different atmosphere where you can't necessarily say or think like that without somebody else thinking a thought towards you. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. He, I, do you hear it? Do you hear Yahweh's voice? He, he, don't set, separate. Don't be partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in Yahweh. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all the, that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to Yahweh. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Take no part. No part. There's like Z. He doesn't give like a 2% error. Like, you know, to, it's okay if you accept this. And it's not to mean that we're going to be perfect all the time. But your doctrine, your principle says, I take no part in these things. And if I do, I need to repent. I need to um, ask for forgiveness. For it is shameful even to what? Even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Wow. You know, it's easy, right, to, to turn your head and say, man, can you believe they, can you believe so-and-so? Can you look, I mean, he's, they did them. It's, it's, he says it's shameful even to talk about it. But I didn't do it. I didn't do that. It just, this is weird. He says it's shameful even to talk about it. There is a level of holiness that Yahweh is calling us to. That's where we should be. First Corinthians, in the last two uh, scriptures I want to share, he talks about having the person, people, um, you know, move to a different camp, outside the camp. It is actually reported that there is sexual morality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans for a man has his father's wife. This is in 1 Corinthians, first century church. This was going on. A man had his father's wife. For well, what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Some people say we shouldn't judge. Yeah, we should judge, but we need to judge rightly. That's why he says, take the, uh, speak at your uh, log at your own eye before uh, helping someone else. But yeah, he says, but those in the church, absolutely. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Man, where's Paul telling them? Same principle, guys. Purge the evil from among you. Purge the evil from among you. So if we have a community and there's evil that's being unrepentant. He says, purge it out, get it out. And what happens here, and as a, as a former minister and as a campus minister and such, what happens here is, is your sentimentality gets in the way of making godly decisions. I'm gonna say that again. Your sentimentality can get in the way of you being godly. What do, what do you mean? You get, we have emotions. We start like, oh, but man. I hate to do that because you know how they're going to feel. Oh, I hate to do that because you know what they're going to say. Man, that won't be nice. Yahweh didn't call us to be nice to everybody. He didn't say, okay, we got to make sure everybody's feelings are ta or everybody's feel nice. He surely doesn't do that with me. He's like, oh, that Brennan, that won't be nice if we did that to Brennan. He says, don't discipline him. <laughs> it's not, my standard is not niceness, but sometimes we can get caught up in being sentimental instead of being saints. So we need to make sure we're pursuing holiness. And, and now it don't have to be me on the other end either. But it's like, no, holiness. And I love God too much. And I love his people too much to protect them. 
And that's why I do it. Matthew 18, you see the same principle. If, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, I love it. He tells us how to go about. If there's some sin that you see and there's sin against you, go tell him. Don't go tell somebody else. Well, I'm just getting advice. I didn't just, I had, go tell that person, clear it up right there. We don't have to bring anybody else in here. If not, still won't listen, get somebody else. If not, bring it before the church. If still won't listen, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, what do you do? Well, we gave him chances. Let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Yahweh deals with this sin. He says, you can come in a sinner, you can come in sinful, but you can't stay that way. You can't just refuse. I'm just not going to, I'm going to do my own thing and I'm, and I'm going to continue to live like this. Okay, but you got to go. Just like sin, you have to go. The individual has to leave as well. I'm sharing this because it, it gives us the spirit and heart of Yahweh and how he sees who we are because he lives in us in this world and because we're, we're, we're his ambassadors who's preaching his word, his word. He desires holiness to separateness. So I'm hoping that you're writing down or taking mental notes or some things that he's moving in your spirit right now. I'm sure that your spirit has been speaking to you about things that you need to say or do, people you need to talk to, prayers you need to have, repentance that needs to be established. I don't know. I'm not in your life. I'm not here to uh, pick about every single part but I hope that you're being sensitive and listening to his voice right now. What is he calling you? I know I feel it. He's saying, Brendan, you got to do, you got to, you got to take it higher. We can do better. So, Cause sometimes we get into a place where we, we justify, we feel good. Again, we look around at other non-believers. We look at other believers and we feel like comparison wise, you know, and when we look at the scriptures, he says, I'm comparing you to my son. You know, this is not what I asked for. I know what I gave you and I know what you're capable of. And I know who I am, and I'm in you. I'm going to go to the next chapter now, in chapter 6, but I'm going to pause here for any other thoughts, because I know there was a lot of thoughts earlier, and uh, make sure nobody else had anything to add or questions. Uh, to me, I, I think uh, um, compared to I'm judging others, it's uh, harder to deal with being judged. <laughs> that's uh, my personally right uh, yeah especially a lot of uh, non-believer friends uh, like what you mentioned about joke uh, their joke is uh, putting you down right they, they think uh, teasing you is uh, a way of uh, uh, being friend um, but uh, but uh, I just know that's a crude very crude uh, joke uh, I told uh, this friend uh, several times i said please don't play this kind of joke with me but he can he just say okay it's who i am it's the way i i do with the friends um and i won't change so to me just uh, okay <laughs> i don't know how to deal with that because um you know what i can what can i do i cannot change him mm -hmm. and i can just let him know how i feel and he ignore my my feelings I, I just feel okay i guess that's uh, that's a friend to be how to say cut off but uh, but uh, it's not that severe that um, you know cut it off uh, i feel i'm i feel like okay i'll just uh, tolerate every time when you torment me <laughs> mm -hmm. but, but i just don't want, i i feel when i see that friend just to feel pressure uh, that i don't feel happy but i tolerate anyway so that's the hard part no it is tough you know um when i 20 years ago i think it is now when i first made jesus lord um again when i was in high school that was my issue a lot and i had to reestablish who i am and what what my standards were i had to draw boundaries people had to know who i am and what i want to deal with and 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 sharing because of that, I lost a lot of friends, and not in a not in a mean or negative way. People just kind of fell away from that because they're like, 
you don't laugh when I joke about that or you don't cuss a lot. You don't, you know, so you're not like that. So um, it ain't feel comfortable around me anymore. Um, or because I, I wanted to make, keep the relationship as much as possible because I want to be a light to them. But I also had to draw boundaries if they were not going to respect exactly. um, who I was. So you have to decide that. And and um, if you, what a friend is for you and how much you're willing to uh, put up with that. But yeah, I will uphold that standard. And this is what I mean by sentimentality. Sometimes the idea that this is my friend, well, why are they your friend? Why are they, are they encouraging and building you up? Why are they a friend? Are they calling you back to a standard that you, what, what is it friendly about them? Maybe, maybe you should have some things you share with them, but if at the core of your spirit, they're tearing you down, it's hard for me to keep calling you a friend because you're not helping. And that's what I mean. It gets, it gets tough. Yahshua illustrated this oftentimes when he was teaching. He was like teaching to the crowds and he would say things and just leave them with something heavy and walk away. I'm like, man, you losing people. What are you doing? He says, if you, you must hate your mother and father and eat my flesh and drink my blood, what are you doing? You're losing people. You can't do this. You're supposed to be gaining followers. You're supposed to be adding friends. Your Facebook group is going to be like nothing. He's like, I'm not worried about that. I'm going to lay a standard out. And my important thing is to follow Yahweh. Whoever wants to hear that voice, I'll follow that. So I can't tell you exactly what to do there, Sharon. Amen. But you want to lay that standard. And you, you cannot be afraid of, of taking out the snippers and going snip, snip on that. Mm-hmm. I will draw the line with you if you want to continue to do that and you know that's not respectful to me. I have, we have to go different directions. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How are you dealing with brothers and sisters who sin against you? You know, um, I mentioned that earlier. How are you dealing with brothers and sisters? Because you, you will have people sin against you, by the way. And I think some people are surprised when they find a brother or sister. You are a brother. You are a sister of Christ. You call yourself a sister? And you just, I'm like, why are we surprised? Like, who in the world does not sin? Like, we're, we're still people trying to figure it out. The whole Bible is written to help us through this. The Bible is wit- written so that we can, uh, it, it's written to us, to help us. It's not even written to the nations, to the Gentiles and saying, hey, guys, this is what you need to, unless you want to follow us. But it's written to the believers saying, here's how we should treat each other, because we got issues. So please don't be, I mean, because I'm, I'm humbled, man, and I'm, 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 I'm convicted. I've hurt so many people, guys. Because I'm in a position to to teach and to influence and to lead. I've heard a lot of people. And sometimes I sit up in bed remembering things I've said and done. I'm like, man, why did I do? And I pray for forgiveness. I ask for forgiveness in many circumstances. But it's painful to deal with that. But how are you dealing with the brothers and sisters that hurt you? Do you go, do you go and talk about it to somebody else? Or are you talking to them about it? I've seen this so much even in church. I shouldn't say even in church because, again, that's why we have these scriptures because we do that. But it's very common. In the name of in the name of Jesus, I'm gonna get some advice, quote unquote advice, and go. And now we're spreading it. We're sharing that name. They know who it is. it's like. They just go talk to the person and deal with that. And then if it's not, you know, bring someone else in. Deal with it in a way that's holy and righteous, so that Satan does not get a foothold in our hearts and the hearts of our community. Pause in there before I go to the next chapter. Brother, to uh, build on what you said to share a while ago, Yeshua had compassion on the multitudes, but he only chose, you know, he had like uh, concentric circles of, of friends, you know, right. and so the, the outer, um, you know, layer would be the, the multitudes and, and then the 70 that he sent out and then the 12. But then his very best friends were uh, Peter, James, and John. Right. And so you want to make sure that your best friends are those who build you up, mm. those that, that will take you higher, those mm. that uh, will uh, take you to account, you know, um, right. When, when they see something that, uh, you know, this doesn't look quite right, you know. There you go. Uh, so, um, you know, don't, don't stay in a relationship that is constantly tearing you down. You know, love that person, but uh, ask, uh, ask our Father for some good friends that will build you up in the most holy faith. Yes. 
man, I'm so thank you. You you just reminded me of something. Um, because we can surround ourselves. Sometimes we surround ourselves with too many yes people. Yeah. You know, we surround ourselves with people who can make us feel good, or who won't love us enough to tell us the truth. Right. You know, we've probably all been in a situation where somebody told us we had something in our teeth or something was wrong with our clothes, <laughs> right. something wasn't fitting right. And then your first thought, if you're like me, is how long have I been looking like this? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. Right and, you, and you think about every interaction you've had, like, who? why did they tell me? Um, so we need to surround ourselves with friends who are not afraid to say, man, your breath stinks. <laughs> your breath really stinks. Um, because we're going to love that. It hurts right there, but thank you for saving me. Um, but yeah, with sin as well. Thank you, Ms. Dottie, for that, because that's one of the challenges that we don't have a lot of people who are, uh, are, are being honest with us and calling us higher. We just consider sometimes, quote unquote, friends, who people who make us feel good. We have things in common. But do you have godly men and women in our life who saying, stop it. You can do better than that. You know God. Oh, you're right. Oh. Do you love the word and truth so much that you're gravitating towards that type of influence? Then you're going to do great. You're going to do well. You're going to always have somebody along with the spirit and his word to keep calling you higher. Thanks for reminding us about that. All right, I'm going to move on to our next chapter here. Numbers chapter 6. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When either man or woman shall separate, to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves to Yahweh, he shall separate from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor come upon his head until the days are fulfilled, in the which he sh separates himself to Yahweh. He shall be holy, and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separates to Yahweh he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father, or for his mother, for his brother, or for his sister when they die because the consecration of his Elohim is upon his head. All the days of his separation he is holy to Yahweh. And if any man die very suddenly near him, and he has defiled the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day he shall shave it, and on the eighth day he shall bring two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering, and make an atonement for him, for that he sinned near the dead, and shall hallow his head that same day. And he shall consecrate to Yahweh the days of his separation, and shall bring a lamb of the first year for a trespass offering. But the days that were before shall be lost, because his separation was defiled. And this is the law of the Nezerite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and he shall offer his offering to Yahweh, one he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, and one ram without blemish for peace offerings and a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil, and their meal offering, and their drink offerings. And the priest shall bring them before Yahweh, and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering, and he shall offer the ram a sacrifice of peace offerings to Yahweh, with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall offer also his meal offering and his drink offering. 
And the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall take the hair of the head of his separation, and put it in the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. And the priest shall take the sodden shoulder of the ram, and one unleavened cake out of the basket, and one unleavened wafer, and shall put them upon the hands of the Nazarite, after the hair of his separation is shaved. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before Yahweh. This is holy for the priest, with the wave breast and heave shoulder, and after that the Nazarite might may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite who has vowed his offering to Yahweh for his separation. Beside that his hand shall get, according to the vow which he vowed, so he must do after the law of his separation. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel, saying to them, Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. End of chapter. And I will bless them. Number six. Um, Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. If you are a uh, part of the Torah community, Hebrew roots, however you want to call it, you've heard this a lot. Growing up um, in the traditional Christian community, I've rarely ever heard about this and didn't think it was such a big deal, of course, but how powerful is that, that Yahweh gave words to Aaron and wish to bless his people? He said, say this. I love that. You don't have to come up with it. He said, say this. And I want to look at this. I'm going to tell you this chapter, in particular, this blessing is so packed, so much to talk about here. I'm just going to uh, restrict myself to one word, bless, because I was going to do bless and keep his face uh uh gracious and pe i was like okay it's gonna be too much we're gonna just have to add to it i even wanted to talk about the nazarite vow i didn't understand that fully when i uh, until i studied it out here recently and um, I, I can't say i understand it fully now but i understand it better but i think it's so exciting that yahweh carved out a way for those who wanted to do more who wanted to be more committed you know the question that came to mind, mind is how much god do you want how much Yahweh do you want? You know, and, and I ask that because if we're honest, a lot of times some of us only want so much. <laughs> like, that's too, I don't want that much. Like, but he says, for those who want more, you want to be uh, uh, um, dedicated in a, in, a, in a deeper way, in a greater way. And there's different levels. It's like, who want, how much Yahweh do you want? And I love that Yahweh allows space for that, to say, you can do more. You can commit yourself more if you would like. Um, and I would call us all to have that standard where we're like, I want as much as I possibly can get. But do you? Do you understand the sacrifice? Do you understand the call of that? So that's another lesson. I say I put that on the burner for uh, maybe next time because I can only do so much one at a time. So I just thought I'm just going to stick with here and Yahweh bless you and keep you. So I, uh, Ms., um, Sister Dottie may still be here and she's a uh, She's fantastic when it comes to the, the Hebrew, especially when it comes to this, being able to say it in Hebrew. Man, it sounds so beautiful in Hebrew. Um, and, and at one point I was trying to learn and I it stopped, but I need to get back to it because it's so cool in Hebrew. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. Um, what is the word bless in Hebrew? Um, <clears throat> Sister Dottie or someone who knows this in Hebrew, would you mind saying it? Just for those of us, I have some people on who may not have heard it or just would love to hear it in the Hebrew, the ironic blessing. If anybody knows that, you can volunteer to say it. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, nor do I have it written in front of me, but it would just be cool to put in the air right now. Okay. Uh-oh, I said the wrong prayer. 
Amen. Love it. Thank you so much for that. Sorry about that. No, you're good. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take more from you. Um, so what is the word bless in Hebrew? I should just stop and just let Dottie take it from here. I just, no, this is, this, this is the great. setup. I'm just throwing it up there for you. You can just take, the, take it from here. <laughs> um, the word blessed in Hebrew, and how is it understood? What is the word blessed in Hebrew, and how is it understood? You see this picture over here to the right, Barak. And depending on how you use it, you may have different uh, ways to say it. But uh, I'm just going to do some real basic. So um, I know you can probably create me in a lot of different places, but I'm going to try to get the um, basic idea. How is it understood? So I put a, um, if you, for those of us who are on the computer and can see, I'm, I'm putting in front of us both the English, the transliteration, um, Hebrew, so that you can see them next to each other. And you see uh, the, the Hebrew, and you see the Hebrew number 1288. And I'm showing you that for a reason, because this word comes up a lot, but it's not always translated bless. How else can it be translated? It, it won't show up in our Bibles as bless, it'll show up in our Bible as something else. What might, what else does it show up as? To bend the knee, to bow. Yeah. So in Hebrew thought, in Hebrew, the, in he, yeah, Hebrew thinking is very concrete. Um, Greek thought is very abstract. What do I mean? Concrete means you can, you can experience it with your senses. You can touch it. You can see it. You can taste it. You can hear it. It's something like real. That's Hebrew thought. So the, the, the most ancient way of writing was just pictures, just like here is a tent, here is a head, here is a hand. And that's kind of what this, that's the Barak we got um, have here. But it's just the pictures. It's just very basic. And we've taken that, uh, I can't say we, but it's, it's, it's changed going through the Greek and such to things like bless. Like bless, you can't touch. Gracious, what is, like, where is that? How can I feel that? Um, um, peace. What, how do I touch peace? So, so you get these abstract words, but in the Hebrew mind, it, pictures come up, things came up. And so it's always exciting. And this is why I really want to learn the Hebrew. And um, just to plug, I know Ms. Dottie, I don't know if you're still teaching it, um, but I know you've I, been doing it. I do, yes. Okay, so if you want to put a plug out there for what you're doing, you can. Um, I don't know if you wanted to, so I'll give you the opportunity to do that. But Ms. Dottie teaches this and has been doing so for years. And my wife has learned from her. My kids have learned. I have my, my daughter sometimes reminded me how to say the Hebrew, uh, uh, this blessing. So um, uh, looking at those, the characters that make up bless, we have Bet. Bet is normally understood. To, it's in the shape of what, like a tent. So this house, I'm not going to go real deep into this. So I know we can, but I'm just trying to get an idea uh, for those who aren't as familiar with it. So we got this tent, which represents, it could be a home. As you see here, an object as a family, or if it's talked about as an action, it could be like be inside. As an abstract idea, it could be representing like unity. So that's the bait part, the b sound that we get. And then you got Barak. And by the way, you don't get the vowels in Hebrew. So you just get the consonants, B-R-K, as we're saying in English. So the resh is the r sound that we get. As an object, it'd be a head. An action, it could be to rule over, because you got the head ruling over, or be above. So that's, so now we put it together. We got this, this, this house, this tent, this family unit, and then we got this head. Um, then we got the cough, which, which looks like a hen. If you see the picture, um, as an action, it can mean to bend um, or cover or anoint, but as an object, it can mean an open hand. Abstractly, it can mean to yield or conform. Um, does that sound about right, um, Ms. Dottie? Do you want to add anything? It, that to is that? excellent. I just I love your visuals. Oh, great. They are so good. Wonderful. Man, that makes me feel great that you uh, affirm that. <clears throat> um, before you go on to the next word, um, you know, not to well, complete, not, not like you said, you have uh, the bed, the rash, and the, the uh, cough. And if you uh, changed uh, those last two letters, uh, it would say 
Bakar. And so Bakar is uh, the first born. And so, um, you know, you have this, uh, you know, you have the same letters that, that uh, you are going to reach your hand to the head of your son. And so the, the bed also um, can represent the son, and uh, especially the son of Yahweh, you know, Yeshua, the son. He is, um, you know, he is the, the life of the house. He's mm. the one that continues uh, your home. Mm. And, and so when you, you uh, lay your hand upon the head of your child, and we wonder why, you know, the Jews uh, represent a small fraction of 1% of uh, the population, but yet uh, they represent... Um, you know, 46% of uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners, and mm. they're just at the top of everything. And this is because they don't curse their children. They don't mm. say, you know, you stupid kid, or that sort of thing. For the mm. time they're babies, the father puts his hand on the child's head every Shabbat and says, may Yahweh bless you and mm. keep you, make his face to shine upon you. And what does that mean when he makes his face shine upon you? It's like when your little girl just, you know, brings you something that she's made for her daddy. Mm -hmm. and, and you just, I mean, your face just beams because that's my little girl. Right. And she, you know, she is showing her love for me. And so, you know, this is what he wants. He wants us to teach our children that Yahweh is a good Yahweh. He is not, um, you know, what, what many of us have been taught, uh, you know, this cruel God of the Old Testament. You know, he is every good and perfect gift comes from Yahweh. And every bad thing comes from the evil one. You know, that's what we need to be teaching our children and blessing them and telling them, yes, you can do it mm. because Yahweh made you. And no, you're not like your sister. That's okay. Mm -hmm. He made you an individual, just like your little fingerprints are different than any other person. You know, so we need to teach our children how unique and how each one has such uh, special gifts from Yahweh. And as a parent, it's our job to look into and, and to ask the father, you know, what is the bend of my child? You know, uh, the verse that we like to quote, you know, that you, know, uh, that you need to uh, discipline your child, you know, while there's hope. Well, that, that word discipline is talking about um, shaping that child in the bed that they want to go, you know, mm -hmm. not to try to make a football player mm -hmm. out of your son when he's, uh, loves the piano, you know, right. um, and so, you know, I think we can learn so much from our Jewish brothers and, and uh, about blessing our children and, and making their lives mm -hmm. successful. Amen. Thank you for that. And please do that, guys. I, I know in only a couple of years, two or three years, since I came to understanding the scriptures as I do now with Hebrew roots and Torah, I do it a lot. I love it. I love that Yahweh gave us something to do instead of we having to wonder, does that work? What could I make? He says, no, do this. And this will put my name on um in this way, you will bless them and put my name on them. And so there's so much to talk about with this. I told you it's full, 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 full in this blessing. And we're only talking about one word at this point, which is bless, <laughs> as we understand it. Um, it's so packed. And I just thought I'm just going to add to it as we go forward. But um, I love to do this um, now with my children. So please just do this. Um, in Genesis 24, 11, as we mentioned, this word shows up in other places. And here, and he made the camels kneel down outside the city. Kneel down was the same word, 1288 Hebrew, kneel down. So yeah. when is it used as kneel down and when is it used as blessed? So I learned, um, I learned that the Hebrew has moods. 
So the language has moods. There's three different moods you can be in when you're looking at a word. It can have three different moods. It can be in the simple, and in this case, it'll just be knelt down, and, it, and it'll be translated in the Bible as kneel, just a simple kneel down. Other is causative. Causative means that you're causing something or someone to kneel down, causing to, this action to occur. You cause me to kneel down. And then lastly is the intensive, which means to drop the knee figuratively or drop to the knee figuratively or literally. So you dropping down to the knee is this idea. So this is where you get the, when, when they're using it in the intensive, it's often when the word bless we see, because it's not simple kneel down, but there, there, there's this idea of you dropping down to your knee. Often to serve, like you see in this picture here, he's dropping to his knees to say, here, here's a coat. In the Greek idea, blessings are centered around the idea of words, like you're saying things, you're talking about things, because that's the abstract line. But again, the Hebrew is all about action. So when you start to hear this blessing from now, you need to think about the action of it. Think about what that means now. Yahweh bless you. See, this is not just, oh, he's like, it, it, it's just kind of a nice sounding thing like Yahweh, bless, like something's happening in the Hebrew mind. And when, it's, when he re originally uh, penned these words, uh, physically, Yahweh bless you. And we're talking about kneeling. So when you talk about kneeling, are you saying that Yahweh is kneeling? Yahweh bless me? Think about that idea. That always struck me as odd and, and bothersome. The creator of the universe, he says, Yahweh bless. Bless me? He's kneeling? Why use that word? Why not use something where he towers over and basks me with something as a great king of all? He says, he's, I'm serving. I'm kneeling to bless you. Yeah, I'm going to put that word there. Yahweh bless you? Yahweh make his face? Yeah, you know, so the fact that you have him doing this is very humbling and exciting when you hear these words spoken. The Yeshua ever Barak in the New Testament. I don't know if I said that right. I probably butchered it. But did he ever bless and Barak in the New Testament, Yeshua? Yes. Where? When? At uh, what Christians call the, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, mm -hmm. which was a Passover Seder. He knelt down and became a servant to, uh, you know, uh, no one had washed their feet. Uh, that was the job of a servant. And so he wrapped a towel around himself and he became the servant. Mm. How uh, difficult, if you've ever had your feet washed, uh, it is challenging to have your feet washed. It's not usually something that you're like, me, me, me. Or like if you're my kids, you're no. like, <laughs> what'd you say? Like Peter, you know, he said, oh, no, you're not going to wash my yeah. feet. <laughs> what was going on in Peter's mind? You are great. You are awesome. How dare you even bend to tie my shoes, let alone wash my feet? Who does but that? Brother, before you go too far with this idea, I want to uh, put the thought in our mind that, yes, he is kneeling, but not in subservience. He is kneeling as we would kneel down to look eyeball to eyeball with our little child. You know, you can tower over your child or you can bend your knee and get down on their level and speak gently to them. And, and that is his favorite thing is to be Abba. Mm. He wants to be Abba daddy to us right yeah absolutely he's not becoming lesser by doing so he's maintaining all of his position and power and authority and choosing to serve and choosing to bless in this way and actually uh, uh, to that point Ms. Daddy, i was going to mention um because sometimes we can mistake it otherwise as you mentioned and he becomes a genie in a bottle yeah, or Santa Claus. <laughs> What's that? Some people treat him like Santa, you know? Right, right. It's like, okay, it's it's your job to give me everything I need. Right. And, you told and, me to ask, and I told you to do this, and I told you to do that, and you, like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, that's wrong. 
So yeah, I wanted to make sure we make that distinction because that's the point. Like, yes, he's doing that, but he has he's still Lord. He's still God over all. He's not your servant to be beckoned on when you want, like you know, in that in that sense. But yes, to your point, John 13, Jesus washed the feet. He laid aside his garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist, then poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So he knelt down and started washing feet. As you mentioned, this is a job that a servant would do when someone would come in. Who? I, it's so encouraging that Yahweh would do this. He doesn't have to. I, I have to. No, he, this is the God we serve. This is the Lord we serve. That he says, I will wash your feet. All my power and authority, I will wash your feet. And continuing with that, when he had washed their feet and put, put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you, you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for I am. I have not lost that position. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example. Yeah. that you also should do just as I've done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed, that uh, comes up again, blessed. You're blessed if you bless. Think about that. Blessed if you're blessed. If you're going to wash and bless, of the, then you, you're blessed. That's how you're going to get a blessing. Do as I'm doing. If you're wondering how... Am I loving this person? Am I loving my, my, my neighbor, my spouse, my friend? You ask yourself, am I washing their feet? Am I looking for a way to serve and bless them and be a neighbor to them? Do as I'm doing. Um, Yashua tells us, be in my example as I'm being. Yes. I'm going to go to chapter 7 here. But the idea is looking at bless. And there's so much we can look at here. But we're talking about blessing. And serving and how Yahweh is blessing us and how we should do so in return. We're blessing each other. Um, but, but again, that act of washing feet, I have a friend in Dallas. Every time I go, we're doing Passover, he wants to wash, do washing feet. And he wants to wash mine. Man, it's humbling. And I'm sure it has something to do with my pride. But to have him wash my feet, I'm talking about in between the toes, bro. I'm like, bro, you just pour some water on it. You be good. It's so humbling. Um, but it, it definitely makes this point about how challenging it is uh, when you respect someone to see them wash your feet um, and how we should be doing that for others. Any other thoughts before we go to our last chapter? All right, chapter seven. And for a sacrifice of peace offerings to oxen, Numbers, chapter 7. And it came to pass on the day that Moses had fully set up the tabernacle and had anointed it and sanctified it and all the instruments of it, both the altar and all the vessels of it, and had anointed them and sanctified them, that the princes of Israel, heads of the house of their fathers, who were the princes of the tribes and were over them that were numbered, offered, and they brought their offering before Yahweh six covered wagons and twelve oxen, a wagon for two of the princes, and for each one an ox. And they brought them before the tabernacle. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Take it of them, that they may be to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and you shall give them to the Levites, to every man according to his service. And Moses took the wagons and the oxen and gave them to the Levites, Two wagons and four oxen he gave to the sons of Gershon, according to their service. And four wagons and eight oxen he gave to the sons of Mirari, according to their service, under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest. But to the sons of Kohath he gave none, because the service of the sanctuary belonging to them was what they should bear upon their shoulders. And the princes offered for dedicating of the altar in the day that it was anointed, even the princes offered their offering before the altar. And Yahweh said to Moses, They shall offer their offering, each prince on his day, for the dedicating of the altar. And he that offered his offering the first day was Nashon, the son of Aminadab, of the tribe of Yehuda. And his offering, one silver charger. And the weight of it was a hundred thirty shekels, 
one silver bowl of 70 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary. Both of them were full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meal offering. One spoon of 10 shekels of gold, full of incense. One young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering. One kid of the goats for a sin offering. And for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he-goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Nashon, the son of Aminadab. On the second day, Nathaniel, the son of Zuar, the prince of Issachar, did offer. He offered for his offering one silver charger, the weight of which was a hundred thirty shekels, one silver bowl of seventy shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meal offering, one spoon of gold of ten shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year, this was the offering of Nathaniel, the son of Zuar. On the third day, Eliab, the son of Helon, prince of the children of Zebulun, did offer. His offering was one silver charger, the weight of which was a hundred thirty shekels, one silver bowl of seventy shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meal offering, one golden spoon of ten shekels, full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Eliab, the son of Helon. And on the fourth day, Elizur, the son of Shedur, prince of the children of Reuben, his offering was one silver charger of the weight of 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meal offering, one golden spoon of 10 shekels, full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Elizur, the son of Shidur. On the fifth day, Shalumiel, the son of Zurishadai, prince of the children of Simeon, did offer. His offering was one silver charger, the weight of which was a hundred thirty shekels, one silver bowl of seventy shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meal offering, one golden spoon of ten shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Shalumiel, the son of Zurishadai. On the sixth day, Eliasaph, the son of Duel, prince of the children of God. His offering was one silver charger of the weight of 130 shekels, a silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, and both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meal offering, one golden spoon of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, 
and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Eliasaph, the son of Deuel. On the seventh day, Elishama, the son of Amihud, prince of the children of Ephraim, offered. His offering was one silver charger, the weight of which was 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meal offering, one golden spoon of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Elishama, the son of Amihud. On the eighth day, offered Gamaliel, the son of Pedajur, prince of the children of Manasseh. His offering was one silver charger of the weight of the hundred and thirty shekels one silver bowl of seventy shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meal offering, one golden spoon of ten shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he-goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Gamaliel, the son of Pedajur. On the ninth day, Abidan, the son of Gideonai, prince of the children of Benjamin, offered. His offering was one silver charger, the weight of which was 130 shekels, one silver bowl of seventy shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meal offering. One golden spoon of ten shekels full of incense. One young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he-goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Abidan, the son of Gideon. On the tenth day, Ahiezer, the son of Amishadai, prince of the children of Dan, offered his offering was one silver charger, the weight of which was a hundred thirty shekels, one silver bowl of seventy shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meal offering, one golden spoon of ten shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he-goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Ahiezer, the son of Ami Shaddai. On the eleventh day, Pagiel, the son of Okran, prince of the children of Aser, offered. His offering was one silver charger, the weight of which was a hundred thirty shekels, one silver bowl of seventy shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meal offering, one golden spoon of ten shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he-goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Pagiel, the son of Ukran. On the twelfth day, Ahira, the son of Enon, prince of the children of Naphtali, offered. His offering was one silver charger, the weight of which was a hundred thirty shekels, 
one silver bowl of seventy shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meal offering, one golden spoon of ten shekels, full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Ahira, the son of Enon. This was the dedication of the altar in the day when it was anointed by the princes of Israel. Twelve chargers of silver, twelve silver bowls, twelve spoons of gold, each charger of silver weighing a hundred thirty shekels, each bowl seventy. All the silver vessels weighed two thousand four hundred shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. The golden spoons were twelve, full of incense, weighing ten shekels apiece after the shekel of the sanctuary. All the gold of the spoons was a hundred twenty shekels. All the oxen for the burnt offering were twelve bullocks, the rams twelve, the lambs of the first year twelve, with their meal offering, and the kids of the goats for sin offering twelve. And all the oxen for the sacrifice of the peace offerings were twenty-four bullocks, the rams sixty, the he goats sixty, the lambs of the first year sixty. This was the dedication of the altar after it was anointed. And when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, then he heard the voice of one speaking to him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the testimony, from between the two cherubims, and he spoke to him. End of chapter. Amen. Thank you for... Uh... Uh, being attended to that. I know that was a lengthy reading. I think it was 89 verses. 89 Aye. verses. Um, and each uh, stanza, each section seemed identical 12 different times. What is that all about? So I, th this was exciting to read, uh, surprisingly, because it seems so redundant. But there's a piece in here that I thought was really interesting. Number seven, verse two to three. It says, the chiefs of Israel approached and brought their offerings before Yahweh, six wagons, <clears throat> 12 oxen, and a wagon for every two of the chiefs, and for each one an ox. So why did these chiefs bring this offering before Yahweh? Why did they do this? There's a question I want to answer here. Why did they do this? What was this about? Was this act prescribed by Yahweh? Is this a command? Something that Yahweh told him to do? Well, if we go back to the passages, and let me see if I can, um, let me see if I can run back here. Aye. Because I don't think I put this up here. Uh, if you go back to the passage, if you're looking on your screen, let me see if I can find it. It says, the prince of uh, Israel, his of heads of the house of the fathers who were the princes of tribes and were over them that were numbered offered and they brought their offering before Yahweh these things and Yahweh spake unto Moses saying take it take it of them and they may do that they may do the service of the tabernacle so they they voluntarily brought these wagons and these ox like in in to the point where Moses like looking to Yahweh what what we he says, you can take it. Here's how, matter of fact, here's what you're going to do with it. There's, like no, there's, not, there's, there's no thing set up for this particular offering. So he has to tell Moses, one, it's okay that you take it. Two, here's what you're going to do with it. Because I know we don't have a plan for this, but here's what you're going to do with it. I want you to distribute it as each uh, of those um, tribes needs, the, the Merorites, the, the uh, the, the three different tribes who were doing a Levitical priesthood. He says, this is how you distribute them according to their service, according to what they do. How beautiful is that? That they, they didn't wait for Yahweh to tell them. There's no law or scripture that says you have to do this. And Moses was left kind of like, okay, is this good? Yeah, we can take it. And here's what we're going to do with it. 
this wasn't a prescription. How do the scriptures encourage us to do the same? So they didn't see, they came up with this because if you remember, each one of those groups, the Merorites, the Gershonites, I, I think I'm saying those right, I, I get the names mixed up, but those three groups had a task to do concerning the temple. The first group, the, I believe the Mer Merorites, um, had to take the holy things, they carried them on their shoulders for the most part. This next group took down all the coverings of the, the tabernacle. The last group took all the poles and the pins and all these things. And, and their brothers are looking at them thinking, hmm, well, how are you going to carry all that? How are you going to get all that? We move a lot. So we're going to pack up things and move out, and you have nothing to carry it with. Here, we have an idea. How beautiful is that? So here's two oxen. Here's a here here here's a, a wagon, and uh, from what you heard, some other things as they dedicate the altar. But they looked at their brothers and saw a need. Unbelievable. There's a principle in that that I, I just get excited about. They were able to see past whatever they're doing in their families. We're busy. We got stuff going on. We got our own duties. And they said, "Hold on, y'all don't have anything to carry that with. Here's what we're gonna do. Every one of us, we're going to uh, dedicate this to you." Somebody finna say something? You got it, Mr. B. Hey, Mr. Hey. Princes. The princes gave these wagons out and they divided, like you just said, two wagons to the Gershonites and four to the Merites. But that was, they had a heavier load right. to carry. They needed more wagons, more oxen. And when you're carrying, you said nuts, bolts, and wrenches and ropes. It's hard for me to carry a bunch of ropes, nuts, bolts, sockets, anchors. So I needed a wagon to put all that in. Mm -hmm. But you, and you know what was so exciting, Mr. Ed, is they didn't have to go to people and say, hey, guys, we don't have nothing. Their brothers thought, saw their need. They were like, you know what, hold on. How are you going to, here's what, let's get together, guys. The, they need something here. And Moses gave the people who needed more, more. So, oh, you, you got a lot of the poles and tents. You need more wagons. And those who were carrying the holy things, they just carried them on their shoulders. They didn't get any. Oh, that's wrong. That's not fair. No, no, no. They got what they needed according to their service. And that's the beauty of that big family you see there is everyone's looking after each other and giving according to where their needs are. And Yahweh didn't prescribe it. People are just looking after each other and saying, hey, what's, let's get this person something. So there's a spirit there that I want us to wrap ourselves around. Were you going to say something else? I give credit to uh, Project 314, Wendy, and the tabernacle and the structure and the materials needed. That's it. Okay. I, I, I guess I don't know what that is, but I guess that's a shout out to Wendy. So praise Yahweh. It's a friend of ours. Uh, it's it's a friend of our sons that uh, is a mechanical engineer that has a different way of looking at the tabernacle. Oh yeah, you mentioned him before. Okay, I got it now. Yeah, it's called Project Three One Four. And thank you, Eddie. <laughs> I love you too. Bye. Yeah, it it goes back to Pi. You know, three fourteen. Gotcha. All right, so. What, how are we encouraged to do the same in the scriptures? In Hebrews 10, it says, and let us consider how to stir up one another. Oh man, just let's bask in that for a second. We're being called to stop, take time out of our day and consider, hmm, I wonder what I can do to encourage. I wonder what, you know what this person needs? You know what this, well, ain't that cool? Instead of just following, okay, I did this job, I did that job, I, I, I did what I was told, we're also called to consider how we can spur one another on and stir up each other to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as, some, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Think about it. He says, think. You know, Philippians says, whatever is honorable, whatever is good, whatever is noble, think. Huh, what can I do? Can you carve out time in your planner today to just consider? Just let the Spirit minister to you and think, 
what are the needs around me? I know I didn't say this in the script. I know they didn't write that down. I know nobody told you to do it, but if you were to consider the needs around you, what would, what would, what would jump on it? You know, Mr. Ed, I appreciate uh, what he does. He's always, um, you know, pulling people together, trying to figure out uh, what can we do? There's no one telling him, all right, it's time to do this. It's time to do this. He's, he'll text me, hey, let's get together. Hey, I'm trying to put this together. I'm just thinking there are some needs here that can be met according to my gifts. I have life. I have hands and feet. There's things I can do. I want to consider that. What would the body of Christ look like if we all stopped 10 minutes a day and just consider how we can stir up one another? How beautiful is that? Hey, my, go ahead. No, I was, it's such a beautiful verse, brother. That is just so mm -hmm. perfect for what they were doing here. That is very encouraging. But it's so simple. And you know what? It's free. <laughs> it like requires, this is the easiest thing to do, but time is our most valuable commodity. Would you stop today and just think, just spend five minutes if you're starting out doing it. Just like, I'm just five minutes a day. Just put a timer. I'm just going to think. You'll be amazed at what comes on your spirit when you are focused on how can I encourage someone today. My daughter's always encouraging me because they're, they're, the way they show their appreciation, they want to draw cards and pictures. <laughs> um, as I sh shared with y'all before, we, we, we've been, um, my, my daughters have been begging me to go back to serve the homeless. We've been putting, making sandwiches for the homeless and we stopped for a couple of weeks. Like, when are we going to go back to do it again? Oh, you said we we're going to put like little scriptures or blessings in there, you know, write notes. And I want to, they want to serve and they're considering what can we do? How infectious and how convicting is it? You know, when they were reminding me constantly, like, let's, let's go, let's do it. But what can, what are you doing? It's, it's, it's not good, brothers and sisters, if you're eating and eating and eating, but you're not sharing. If you're eating and you're consuming, the, if you're being blessed by this lesson right now, and you're not sharing it. If you're being blessed by what you're reading in his scriptures, if something in your spirit is being stared up and moved, but you're keeping it to yourself, it's not good. And I, I've done that for so many weeks, and I didn't teach, and I didn't share it. And it just, it was like Jeremiah, fire shut up in my bones. And I didn't do as well spiritually when I'm not sharing. You know, my R, R, it says, he who refreshes others, he himself will be refreshed. Mm -hmm. And then we saw earlier that uh, Yahshua's words, who was saying that we need to bless others so we can be blessed by serving them. But the, the blessing, guys, comes in the giving. The, okay, here's another scripture you know. It's better to, all right? It's more blessed to give than we, come on. We have to stop and consider so if you're feeling good, if you, oh man, another scripture just came to mind. If you have any encouragement, <laughs> if any love, if any tenderness from his, from his fellowship, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same spirit and purpose. If you have anything, guys, let's join together in how we can think, how we can encourage other people. Philippians 2, Paul talks about Timothy in such an endearing way. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. I have no one like him who's genuinely, genuinely concerned. You ever meet someone who you know has a genuine concern for you? They're not just saying, I'm going to pray for you. They're not just saying, I hope you, I wish you well but they genuinely have a concern for you. There's only a few people like that, really, that you come across sometimes, and you can feel it. They have a genuine concern. How do you know they follow up with you? Because I'll be honest, it's hard to pray for someone consistently and not follow up with them. It's really tough. <laughs> because when you're praying, you're looking for the fruits. You pray and you're looking for what God's doing, and you want to see how is it going, brother and sister. When someone's genuinely concerned for you, and you can't have this for everyone. Like you mentioned, um, Ms. Dottie, it's okay that you don't do it for everybody. We don't have that much energy and time. Don't feel guilty. You can't have that. You have your, your two or three. Then you have your, your 12. You have, you, you have that. Uh, so don't feel like I need to be this for everybody. But man, if we had a one or two that we had this genuine, oh, we have genuine concern, hopefully, for everyone. But we showed this level of consideration. We went to that next level. He says, generally concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests. Everybody seeks their own interests, not those of Yahshua HaMashiach. 
everybody seeks their own interest, but not everybody seeks the interest of what's best in the kingdom of God. So be like Timothy. A lot of many of you are like Timothy, where you're considering not just yourself, but how can I serve other people? Uh, my happiness, praise Yahweh, comes in knowing that you are encouraged. You know, I look forward to showing up to see you show up. I look forward to recording this so that others, it just does me so good. It's just blessed. And I know you know what I'm talking about. You guys are such a blessing and you're being a blessing to so many, but it's such a blessing to know that you're blessing others. It's so fulfilling. It's like, wow, that's like good. That's some good stuff. Speaking of that, on the side note, please share with me uh, in this lesson or in the chat, because um, I want to know what things are what things are helpful to you in this format, in this lesson? What do you like? What's standing out to you? I want to make sure I continue to do that because I want to be a best service to you. I could just be in my own world and do what I think is good, but talk to me. Let me know. I like when you do that. This really helps me in my ministry. This really helps me in my spirit. Um, could you do this more? If there's something I could do more. So please add that to the chat or share that with me because I don't want to just be in my own world kind of doing something that I like and I think, but my whole goal is to serve you and to encourage and inspire you, challenge you in the name of Yahweh, uh, Yahweh and Yahshua. So uh, please let me know uh, what your spirits are saying, if I can do something more, or I continue doing particular things that I, I may not realize. First John chapter three, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. See, these guys, when they thought of this idea of giving the chariots, they were thinking of, oh, look, we get, we're gonna give up something for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods, and sees his brother in needs. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother, I know you need to carry this stuff, man. Hey, but God didn't tell them. Maybe they're supposed to just carry it. And look at Yahweh. He says, Moses, it's okay. Take it. Matter of fact, the reason it was so long is he made sure that each tribe had one day dedicated to offering their, sac their, their, their offering to the altar. Every tribe got and, and they repeat it just the same way because each tribe was special in their offering. No, we're not going to just take it all. No, there one day, this is for you. Next day, this is for you. Because that's what, that's what they did it back then. If you were a king or whatever, it would be a big triumphant thing and everybody's coming and offering gifts and this is big fan for He's like, no, this is coming to my temple. It's coming to my offering. We're going to do this right. And every tribe is going to get to hear their name and we're going to acknowledge what they're doing. If you see your brother in need, yet um, do not come out of your pocket with your worldly goods or come out of your time, whatever it is. It says, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees a brother, brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? This principle was active even then. This is why I like to share, guys, um, what we've seen in the Torah with how all the rest of the scripture. It's the same principles. Yahweh did not change. He's like, I want you to have that idea. We can sit and say, let me do minimum and just do what he told me. I didn't see that in the scriptures. Think, consider, what can I do? Little children, let us not love in word and talk, but in deed and in truth. Are you loving in actions? Look across the table now. Um, is that I, I, I haven't forgotten that you mentioned how the, 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 the camps were set up and how maybe it was likely that each camp could look over the backs of the other camps across from them and protecting them. And that camp can look over their backs, protecting the others. And what a beautiful, what a beautiful family and symphony that is. I see you. I see what you're going through. And we all see what the Levites are going through. We're protecting them here in the middle. And I see you. Shame on me for, to ignore your need. Or if, if, if this is the case, do I see you? Do you see your brother or sister's needs? I know during a time like this, even especially can be tough because we are not physically meeting together. We, don't, we can't go off to the side and have conversations and see our face and, and whatever. Um, we can stay in contact you know, through Zoom and phone, but do you, are you aware of your brother's and sister's needs? You know, I feel so disconnected uh, with where is everyone? How's everyone doing at times? And that's something that I started going back with the poor and trying to pull up this uh, uh, setup now. It's like, I feel disconnected. What's going on with my brother? What's going on with my sister? Sure, I can share some scriptures, but how are they doing? 
how can I think about giving to them? I don't even see them. I don't even have a clue. So I have to put myself in position to do that. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're at home. Maybe you've been at home. And maybe even before the whole quarantine time, you've not really been able to connect because you're not looking for that connection or you just haven't been seen it. But he always says, consider this. What can we do? I want to show this last scripture here and to sum it up. Then he always said to Cain, where is, your, where is Abel, your brother? I think this question still reverberates in my mind throughout our generations. Throughout our, our churches, throughout our congregations, throughout our ministries, I think this question still, in my mind, reverberates off the walls of our, our buildings and our hearts. Where is your brother? He's asking, where is your brother? And he responds, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? You know, I'm glad that they were able to look at their brothers. I know where my brother is. He's here and he's in need. I know where he is not so much physically, but where he is spiritually. I have an idea of where he is in his, his needs. I, I know where he is. And, and we, we can't know the needs of every single person, but we need to be connected with the people God has called us to be connected with. We need to be connected, period. Um, with, with our brothers and sisters. So that, bro, that, that question, I believe, still rings true. Am I my brother's keeper? And the answer that keeps coming back, yes, I am, or I should be. So we have to make sure I'm doing my, my work in that. Ava, Ava, um, close the door, Mama. And close the door, Mama's finished. Mama, what's up, okay? Mama, what's up? Sorry. So, um, am I my brother's keeper? I'm going to pause it before I summarize. Anybody else had anything you want to add? Brother, I think that we don't pray for each other enough. We underestimate how many things can be changed by prayer and um, sometimes you know when i can't sleep in the middle of the night i just i think about all the children that don't have anyone to pray for them or i think about my brothers and sisters in other lands that are being persecuted beyond measure and and martyred for their faith when we have it so easy here. Mm. And, you know, I think that uh, we, we need to be sensitive to not just those in our immediate circle, but those that don't have anyone to pray for them. Um, during this time, I've been especially burdened for uh, child abuse victims, you know, uh, as, as a child, I can remember school was my refuge. Mm. And I know that it's that way for countless thousands of children. And, uh, you know, to, to be uh, at home uh, all this time, I, I just have been subverted for the little ones that, that don't know Yahweh and that, that um, are not being taught anything about his love, uh, that he would just reveal himself. Um, and I, I pray for the teachers so much. Mm. Uh, you just don't know what kind of influence you have and how, you know, just one teacher that has faith in you and that builds you up uh, can make such a difference in your life. And so, you know, I think we need to pray for those that are spiritually over us, but also, uh, you know, teachers of any kind that have uh, especially influence over children. Thank you. That's where Yahweh wants our hearts. Um, James one twenty six, religion that God considers pure and faultless is this to keep oneself from being polluted by the world and to look after orphans and widows and their distress. Look after orphans and widows in their distress. He's, he's after the powerless. 
And, and if if all we're going to do is take these words and keep them to ourselves, he says, that's not what I wanted. He says, is this the type of fasting that I've offered for you to not go without food and eat? This is not, this is not, no, no, it's to unbind the shackles. Yes. And if we can't do that physically, we need to be on our knees doing that. We need to, we, we, we need to be looking for ways. Um, we are his hands. We are his feet. We are his eyes. We are, we, we are his body and he's wanting to use us. And guys, there's something you're going to hear from me a lot is my ministry, Ephesians, uh, I think it's five. My ministry is to equip the saints. Yes. Yes. It's to equip the saints. You, when you're equipping somebody, it's not just to walk around the house. <laughs> it's, hey, look what I got. It's equipping you for a purpose. May Yahweh bless you and open your mind and eyes to see your ministry. Because that's my goal, is to equip you so that we won't be like children tossed to and fro through the wind, but we can stand strong. We can be strong hands now. All I can do is all I can do. I can't do every part. I can just do my part and you do your part. But he says, when every joint is working properly, the body is built up and strong. Amen. And I want to, I want to encourage every one of you hearing this to please do not take this just for yourself. Fine. Do you need to make a website? Do you need to go knocking on doors? Do you need to pull your aunt in or your cousins in and talk? To, I don't know what it is. I can't tell you. I don't know what he has in your spirit to do, but he wants to ring out his message. And those children need our hands. Um, those adults in those uh, homes in our hands. It's funny you mentioned this, Dottie, because that's the work I do. That is my work now. I work as a behavioral specialist in our district, and we deal with that work that you just say, just talked about, where we, where we uh, work with kids, um, especially struggling students. Uh, that's what I get called in for. And during this time, there's been a lot of concern from teachers and, and staff members about the condition of those students. Like, man, I wonder how it is because I know at home it's not good. I'm not even going to sugarcoat it. It's not good. <laughs> I can be like, well, no, it's not good in a lot of homes. And um, the least we can do is pray. So thank you, Dottie, for bringing that up. Um, please, please, let's be praying for each other. Let's be praying for their needs. Let's be active in sharing our faith. Let's be active in keeping in step with the Spirit. Do not take this message and keep it to yourself. Matter of fact, maybe next time we'll share out. Maybe next time we'll share out how uh, we allow Yahweh to use it, how we let that thing manifest and say, this is what I'm doing with this. Um, I felt moved to do something. I promise this, he's moving because his word doesn't come back empty. He says, I'm getting something out of this and I want to know. Um, I want you to encourage us with, with, with what it is that you're doing. So amen to that. Anybody else? All right, so chapter five, we talked about cutting off, tear it out, throw it away. What is it? Make some decisions here. That's why I like to summarize. I want you to look back and start making the decision. You might want to write some things down. I have some things in my heart that I feel that the Spirit is saying, stop it. Stop it. Tear that out. Tear. You've been playing with this for too long. You've been struggling. You've been challenged. You've been growing. No, no stop it. It has to stop. What is it for you? But he said, look. I know you're probably doing better than uh, this person. I know you're doing better than you did last year, last two years, but I need this to be cut off now. I need this to be cut off now. I need you to tear that out. Relationships we talked about as well. I need that that needs to be sev severed now. You're holding on to them too closely to this relationship. You need to consider that option of that may need to go. Yahweh bless you and keep you. We talked about in chapter six. So we talked about how beautiful it is that Yahweh will bless us. I just that's just an encouraging point, Yahweh blessing us. And that in turn, we should be, he says, no, no service greater than the master. Are we blessing others? He says, if Yahweh in all his greatness is blessing us, how much more should we be willing to wash the feet of our neighbors? And this is still the same spirit, right? Because now we're going into chapter seven where they did that. He said, How can I serve you? How can I consider you? And so in chapter seven, we see that they brought their offerings before Yahweh. They brought him before the Levi said, we see your need, brother. We see your need, sister. You don't have to say nothing. I ain't gonna, I'm not going to sit here and let you carry this stuff throughout the desert. We're bringing something to you. Even to the point where Yahweh had to tell Moses, it's cool. It's okay. You can do that. These guys just pulled it together and said, we're going to take care of us, of each other. Love it. 
Um, so that's all I have. Um, uh, again, any thoughts on, on that? I'm going to pause and otherwise we'll close out with prayer here. Um, uh, yeah, we'll close out with prayer. Anything else? All right. Thank you guys for those who share with me some things that are helping you. Um, that helps me to continue to do those things. Please email, uh, call me, reach out to me if there's other things. Um, I, I'm really am trying uh, to make this the best I can to give you the equipment. I, I got the YouTube channel, I got the website. I'm really, this is for you, not for me. Actually, it blesses me too. I'm not gonna be, I'm gonna be honest. It's a really big blessing for me. Um, but I wanna make sure it's serving you in the best way. 